as a professional speaker, author, presentations coach, leadership expert, and owner of Your Next Speaker, LLC. Brett Laubach has taught leadership skills for more than 20 years to one million audience members in 48 states, the Bahamas, and Canada. Is Oklahoma a 48th state, or, or have you been here before? Let's talk about that later. Okay. <laughs> Red's clients include students, educators, business professionals in the agriculture, sales, human resource, banking, health, transportation, and insurance industries, basically everywhere. His programs are high energy and impact, and high impact. You can find links to all of his material as well as information about his keynotes and workshops at yournextspeaker.com. Red loves the Lord, his wife, and watching his three daughters grow up in Edmond, Oklahoma, so I suppose he's been here before. I have. Join me for a warm welcome for your next speaker, Red Lobo. Thank you very much. I'd like to say that, uh, hold on a second, let me, let me grab something that someone brought for me. It's, uh, it's an honor to be with you tonight. Uh, I've, I've been talking since the age of two and have been doing it uh, professionally since 1999. And there are times throughout the year where I know that the room that I have is full of not only good looking, well showered people like yourselves, but also folks. Some of you are like, thank you very much. Someone noticed finally. Um, but also is full of people who are just out there changing the world. Just making things happen. My wife and I went to two movies earlier today. By the way, Everest, phenomenal movie. It's a climbing movie. And uh, The Martian. <laughs> one is based off of real life, one is not. Uh, turn to your partner, someone close to you, see if you can guess which one is not a real life story. Um, but, but the movie Everest, I mean, I mean, whenever the movie Everest was over, my wife, you know, I asked her, how do you, how do you like it? What do you think? And she thought, well, it was, it was kind of like a documentary. And I was like, I know it was awesome, wasn't it? It was so amazing. She said, no, actually, it wasn't. Um, but The Martian is a great movie, so is Everest. But The Everest is about heroes. It's about people that, well, first of all, it's about people that may pay a lot of money to make what I would think would be a poor life decision. <laughs> <laughs> Let's climb about 30,000 you know, feet up into the air. We're in a place that's literally called the death zone. Let's go, right? But then there's certain people that that's their job to go help those you know, folks. And then there's certain people that have to go rescue people that go back up into those areas. And those folks are just heroes, unbelievable. And that I'm blessed in my life for many reasons. And one is because I get to work with heroes every day, and that's called teachers. Every single day. Teachers and students are the heroes, and if you don't treat the teachers in your life that you are either the boss of, or that you get to help, or that you are, uh, then, 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 then you, need to, you need to leave right now and go to a different conference, right? You just got to get right with the world, because something is not right, right? And now I am thinking as someone whose dad was a teacher. I'm a product of three things, really. Right? I'm a product, uh, which what I mean by that is, in my 42 years of life, I have any success in my life is because of three things. Number one is because of my faith. Number two is because of my family. And number three is because of my student organization. And I grew up on a pig farm in northwest Oklahoma. And uh, some of you, you don't, you, don't, you don't need to guess what student organization I'm from. I'm from <laughs> Fafa. <laughs> That's how you pronounce it. You knew that, right? <laughs> You're confused? That's FFA. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> my dad was an ag teacher for 28 years. My dad was actually, in 2005, he was actually inducted into the Ag Teacher Hall of Fame. They have that, the Oklahoma Ag Teacher Hall of Fame, right? And the reason why they have that is because if you were going to be any uh, CTSO advisor, will it be, whether it be FAFA or DECA or FACLA or HUSA <laughs> or SCOSUSA or BPAW or FABLA, right? <laughs> or TASA, any of them that exist, right? If you're going to go like fully engaged and be an advisor in a CTSO, as well as, hello, you must teach, you know, every day, it's absolutely heroic. Like, it's absolutely heroic, right? When my dad retired, there was a part of them that was like, thank you, baby Jesus, for letting me survive all the way to retirement, right? And he blamed all the hair that he lost and any hair that he had left that was gray on every eighth grader that he ever had to work on in the program, right? 
But it's absolutely just amazing to see these people. And I and I and I'm just blessed to, to say that my dad, my dad was an integral part in career technical education in Oklahoma and across the nation. Uh, and so whether you go to DECA or FBLA or DPA or Career Tech or you know one of the wonderful organizations that's here sponsoring this and putting on this, or, or if you're a or if you are a sponsor, you know, whatever your reason is for being in this room, you just look like a good time and you're sitting, like you're sitting there for a while, right? You know, why are you in this room? I hope that you firmly understand and that you are a phenomenal ambassador for career tech education and for CTSOs because they change lives, absolutely change lives. And the people that work in these every single day and do it right, they're going into the death zone. Now that can mean a couple of things, right? And what that, what, that, what that means when I say it is that they're going into a place that if they do it right, there are so many things that are going to die every single day, right? Disengagement in school is going to die when we do what we do right, right? A, 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 poor, a poor belief in, in self is going to die. If when we do career tech education right, right? When DECA is done right, when FBLA is done right, right? Having no idea or not even a close idea of where I'm going to go to in my future, that's going to die, right? When it's done right, right? And that's just, I, 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 not to tell you, I wear the FFA, National Blue Corn Gold, everywhere I go, because, because it, it matters in my life. And I'm an ambassador for it. And anyone in this room that represents DECA, represents BPA, represents FBLA, represents career tech, in any way, I hope that, 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 that what you're doing right, every day is basically yelling at, your, at the students that are in your program, whether adult or, well, there's a lot of yelling, yes, but whether they're adult students or high school students, just yell at them every day to say, when you're 42 years old, I hope that you want to wear the color and the logo, right? That they still want to be an ambassador and still want to give because we need them. And anyone in this room that knows what uh, is the either success or death of career or technical education knows we need a lot of people, right? And a lot of important people and a lot of giving people to really understand the value of what we do because it's amazing. And so some of those people are in this room, and I want to say my good friend Ryan Underwood, one of my best friends in the world, sitting right up here, and uh, Lori Irk sitting right beside. Him. And Lori is the reason why these are here. She walked in and gave me a hug and a box of Fruit Loops. And the reason why is, in 1999, I don't know if you know this part of the story, I was traveling to the state of Colorado doing some Colorado FBLA conferences. They still to the date. Matter of fact, last week, I was in Grand Junction, which is next to Utah. And then we, and then we drove seven and a half hours to Pueblo, which is nowhere near Utah. And then we drove to Sterling, and then Greeley, and then Denver. And I was with uh, Tri Leadership, was the company that I was traveling with. Ryan Underwood is the, is the uh, creator of Tri Leadership. Uh, and, uh, and we were doing these little conferences. And so Laurie hired me in 1999 to go travel and do my little speeches. And I didn't know what I was doing. Dick, in 1999, are you kidding me? I could barely, I'm a, I grew up on a pig farm. I could barely make my nouns and verbs agree, right? <laughs> But I, but I took FFA all the way, as you can imagine. I was a state officer for a couple years, and when you get a student through that experience, they either love giving speeches or they never want to talk in public again. Right? One or the other. And so I, I had this just, uh, just affinity for Fruit Loops back in the day. And so she brought me in Fruit Loops. Now, what you may not remember, Lori, is it was, okay, it was, it was October 1999. Okay? I got married to my bride, my woman, Ashley, who, by the way, was also named after Donald the Wind. My name is Rhett, named Rhett Gone. <laughs> right? Right? If you haven't seen it, by the way, best 17 hours of your life, you should see it. <laughs> Ashley, a lot of people don't know that Ashley was just a you know a boy's name back in the day. Ashley was another lead character in Gone with the Wind, right? And so she was named after Gone with the Wind as well. She was not born a boy, though. She's been a girl her whole life. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that means different things now than it used to. But I proposed to Ashley in December of 1999. Okay, y'all with me? October 99 in Colorado at the Staples in Pueblo, Colorado. I get a phone call from my wife Ashley, and then my girlfriend, uh, and she says to me, "Hey, Red, just wanted to let you know." Um, Mom and I were talking, 
and the church that we're thinking that if we do get married, that we'd like to get married in, books up really quick. So we went ahead and reserved the church. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> Probably hadn't even talked about it a whole lot. But we just got the church book. My mother in law's been in charge of me ever since. We're going to be fine. But uh, so Lori, Tammy Brewer is a client of mine, and Melissa Scott, and Kelly, Kelly Scholl. Kelly, where are you? And Kelly right there. And, uh, and my friend Dustin up here in the front. And the, uh, if, if, you, if you think that tonight, before now and 6.30 anyway, is a total waste of time. It is Carrie DeMoot's uh, fault, because she's the one that introduced me to Jim Gleason. <laughs> Carrie, is, Carrie is, is a client, I still remember Carrie, uh, that whenever I used to get letters of recommendations, now this is a good story. Okay. When I used to get letters of recommendations from former clients, I asked the guy, what was it like 1995? Long time ago. Were you, what was, were you at Chip and Trevor? No. Yes, you worked at Chip and Trevor. Yeah. So I've been speaking a little bit. And I learned uh, a couple things uh, and I <coughs> about what I hope you are leading the people that are in your life and your education. I hope that you're leading them to just continue to know that these things are important and to, and to do some checkups from the neck up, as my mentor Zig Ziglar uh, used to say, um, in just a couple things. And so let's start with this. Turn to someone beside you and please tell them what this is. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> See if, you know what, see if you know what club it is. See if you know what club it is. Other than those that can see it any place. Do we, have, do we have any golfers in the room? Any golfers in the room? Hey, man. Anyone not play golf in the room? Raise your hand. Anyone like my wife that when golf comes on, you're like, this is the best put you to sleep medicine ever been? Yes. Exactly right. Okay, so, so let's begin with the really important stuff. Let's begin with golf. Shall we? So I was, uh, well, Ashley and I <laughs> booked the church in October 1999. Uh, got engaged in December of 1999. I got married June 2000. We lived in Tulsa, and then we moved to Edmond. And when we moved to Edmond, which is, which is a little village just north of here, okay, about, about, about 15 minutes. Um, and when we moved to Edmond, the gentleman that was across the street, his name was Earl. And Earl was a single gentleman, uh, African-American man, well-built, firefighter. This guy had the cleanest garage you've ever seen in your entire life. I mean, this thing was, I mean, just spotless, right? It was gorgeous. It was OCD off the charts. <laughs> and Earl and I became friends. We kind of chat. And he came over one day and he said, hey, I, am, I know that you play golf. This is what he was saying to me. He played golf and I, I'd like to tell you what's going on. Some of my firefighting buddies are trying to get me to go play golf with them and learn to play golf. He didn't know how to play golf at that point, okay? And I said, well, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm taking my bag to the, you know, to the driving range, hitting them all, and it's just not going well at all. And I said, Earl, Earl, let me save your life, bro, all right? Let me, on behalf of humanity, let me repay the favor a little bit here. Here's what you need to do. You need to go to the driving range for at least the next three weeks, and you need to take only two clubs with you. Two clubs, okay? Golfers in the room. What do you think are the two clubs that I recommend that he go learn how to hit? Okay, Nick, what do you think? The putter. The putter, right. You tell everyone, Nick, go ahead and stand up here. Nick, thanks from Iowa. That's the state north here. Yes, Nick, how you doing? I want to give Nick a round of applause. Yeah. We know that some people didn't clap. That's okay, because really all you did was stand. And they're like, I'm say, we're going to do like five this weekend. Nick, why the putter? Uh, where do you score? Where do you score? Yeah. Okay, would you like to be more specific? <laughs> no. Anyone who <laughs> plays golf knows that you're going to get half of your score on the putting green. So if you get good at putting, you're well anyway. The other club that I told him to take was a seven iron. And the reason why I told him to take the seven iron is I said, Earl, here's the deal. When you learn, when you teach your muscles how right, to hit a seven iron, in his case, probably 170, 175 yards, uh, then your muscles know the basics of how to hit almost every club in the back. So you know how to hit this. Hello. Dun, 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 dun. I'm loving it. You can pick up almost any other club, and you're well on your way. Okay? And so about two weeks later, he came, he came back over. He almost hug-tackled me. Right? 
You ever hug that with someone? It's, it's fun. Um, he said, Rhett, changed my life. I went out there, I hit set iron, which is a relatively easy club to hit, right? apart like almost everything else that Nick left out. Right? Um, uh, right? Very relatively easy to hit, so it's easy to start playing in there, and he was well on his way. Now, why are we telling the story? The reason why we're telling the story is because it is in my belief that whenever we do just a couple of things right in educating students, uh, those things are like the seven iron. You get those things right, and there's a lot of other things that are going to fall into place. Like I told students this week, um, if you will simply learn how to give your best at your number one job, which is to be a student, you can give your best, not straight A's. Straight A's may not be your best. But if you can learn, if you can work on the muscle of how to give your best at your number one job, what you're going to find as you go through school is that even when the studies get more difficult, it's not going to get more difficult for you because you've worked out in the right muscles, right? You've worked out the right way. So even when the classes get a little more difficult, it doesn't become necessarily that much more difficult for you. And they were like, that makes no sense to me. <laughs> like, that doesn't make any sense. And so that's what we do is, as motivational speakers, we inspire them, we send them back to you, and then you explain it. Right? <laughs> are you still recording? Uh, so what are those things? Well, I believe that this entire world that we live in called getting a student started down a path toward a career, whether it be entrepreneurship, which is really just, you know, undecided, is really the point call that. Right? I'm undecided, let's see if I can go make some money at it, right? <laughs> Whether it be business, whether it may be, whether it be agriculture, whether it be speaking, if we can get them started when it really matters, right? Adult students, yes, we've got a lot of those, but, but, but in their formative years, right, then that is a seven iron in life. There's so many things. Now, it's difficult, okay? Now, let's get something to take a few notes on. Everyone has a device, I'm sure. Let's pull your device out, please. You've got a phone. You've got some place to take some notes on that. Some of you brought some weapons with you. You have a writing utensil. Everyone, please, let's, let's, let's type or write in just a couple of things, all right? a couple of things. Everyone's going to need a partner for this, so everyone formulate a partnership in the room. Someone needs to be your partner seated beside you. Help them out a little bit if they need some help. If you have a device built since 2000 and really one, it'll have a notes app in it if you don't, if you don't normally take notes on your phone. I'd like you to type in three numbers when you're there. Check with your neighbor see how they're doing. Are they there? Let's type in these three numbers, please. 29, 54, 17. Let's type those three numbers in, please. 29, 54, 17. 29, 54, 17. Someone do the math for me. What, what do we got there? What do those add up to? Do they have 200? Yes. Yeah, good. Thank you. Sometimes. Sometimes it's Ankin, not Ankin. Right. So, right. All right, so the Gallup organization, you may have heard of them, they like to do some research as well. They did a poll a number of years back, basically they, they asked a number of different folks out in the workforce, blue collar, white collar, gold collar, no collar, a number of questions. One of the questions was, how do you feel about your job? Some of you may have seen these stats. How do you feel about your job? And here's what they were able to do based off these answers. Okay. What they were able to do, out the side 29, write or type in actively disengage. 29% of their population they study actively disengage in their work. How do you feel about your job? They ask a bunch of different questions, but they can fit into that bucket. Actively disengage, 29%. Now that's scary, right? That's scary, but that's true, okay? Job is just a job to a lot of people. J to the O to the B. Pay me, good. If you don't pay me more, well, I may go somewhere else. If you want to fire me, that's fine. I'll just go get another thing. 29%, 54%, outside 54 Disengage. So not actively disengage, but disengage. Right? Disengage in their work. Work is just work. Now the actively disengage, they're looking to cause trouble. Right? They're okay with being lazy. They're fine with being mean. They're fine with being rude. They're actively disengaged. They, 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 and, and a lot of us know that it's not about the job. It's about, for a lot of them, it's about something else in their life. Right? That's fueling that active disengage. 54% disengage in their work. What do I mean by disengage? It means that they are not giving more. They're not in the 17%, which the 17% are actively engaged. 17% actively engaged. Now, what does this tell us? 
This tells us that finding a career that you love and that you want to be actively engaged in is a difficult thing to do, right? Very difficult. Very difficult. It is, it, it is tremendously complicated, right? It is challenging. It is very difficult to be able to find a career that you absolutely just fuels you up and that you love. What, what else do we know about our careers, though? What else we know is that when we find a career that we love, there's so many other things in our life that improves, right? When I feel good about my job, I also feel good about the other areas in my life not related to my job. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not telling you guys anything you don't know. What we're starting with here, though, is this, is this thought that it is very difficult for us to be able to find a career that we're absolutely wanting to give our best to, right? Now, I've got a friend. His name is Jason Kruska. He passed away about two months ago. Jason, speaking of The Martian, the movie, um, Jason worked at Johnson Space Center in Houston. Right? And he worked in satellite communication. And he was one of those guys that was like literally, pun intended, mission critical. Like the math that he did and the work that he did was integral to astronauts talking to astronauts, astronauts talking to the ground, the ground talking to the ground, the satellites talking to satellites. This guy was in there and he loved his job. Absolutely loved his job. And he passed away, had a kidney stone, and 3% uh, of people who get kidney stones have this complication, he passed away from it. What you don't know about my friend Jason, he's been a quadriplegic since he was 14 years old. Broke his neck, was in a wheelchair, could barely move even one hand. You had to, when you talked to Jason, it was like talking to a three-year-old. You had to be around him a lot to understand their words, right? But he was one of the most important people at the Johnson Space Center, and he loved his job. He was quite a And I was asked to speak at his funeral. And I was asked to, he had a memorial in Houston with the NASA people, then he had a memorial in Alpes, Oklahoma. That's a little village down in southwest Oklahoma. Uh, and I was asked to speak on uh, his family's behalf and basically give my version of the transcripts that his new two bosses at NASA gave in their speeches at his memorial down, down in Houston. It's unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable what this man did. And so what do we learn from this? Well, what we learn from this is that everybody's dealing with challenges. Everybody's dealing with something. Jason was, in terms of his career, Jason, there's a very good chance he would not have been working at NASA if he had not had his accident when he was 14. There's a very good chance that that's true. Because because of his accident, he had to compensate, and he had to work, and he had to do so many things to make his brain work in a, in a, at, a, at a higher level because of his physical limitations. Couldn't write. Right? That his brain was just built to do complicated math in high-stress situations like we're going to have to, right? And he had to work to do that. What do we do in career tech? What do we do in CD? What do we do in CPSS? We challenge students. We push them, right? But we know a couple of very key things. We know a couple of very key things. And this is how Jason's involved. Please type in whatever version of this you'd like. We know four things, okay? Number one, number one, where a student comes from matters. Where a student comes from matters. It makes a difference. Any educator in this room or anyone who's helping educators understands that you, you, there is no vanilla when it comes to students, right? You've got to get to know what, what you need about this student. What's their background? What's their history? What's going on at home? Who, who are they? How do they think? How do they, what, what, what's their challenge? You've got to understand that. If you don't understand, like someone with Jason, he, he rolls in, you can it, immediately, boom, yep. Jason's got some physical limitations, right? There's something there, like that's immediate. Most of the times when we work with students, those limitations and challenges are not, we can't see them. Sometimes we, it takes a number of weeks to even learn about it. But, but where students come from absolutely matters. We know that for a fact, right? Now, as Gene said, we, I have young students at our house. We have three daughters, so I live with four women, right? And there's two things that are happening because I live with four women. Number one, I've been broke since 2005. Thank you very much. And number two, I'm going a little more insane every single day, right? <laughs> Literally, I am serious. I thought after marrying and then having children who are female, I would understand females more now than I did before. No, I, I know for a fact, Melissa, I know less now about, about females than I did before. 
I've got a 10 year old, her name is Vivian. Okay, you follow me? Let's go back 10 minutes ago. Brett, Ashley, Vivian Lee played Scarlet, right? And Gone with the Wind, okay? Right? So Vivian is 10. Our other two daughters are Mammy and Prissy. Those are their names. <laughs> That's not true. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. That's fine. Okay? We have a 10 year old named Vivian, and she, and she is just a people pleaser. She's one of those folks, and you're like, why are, are you, are you, how, how, you, how are you so nice, right? How are you so friendly? And then we've got an eight year old. Her name is Addison. She's a third grader. And Addison, speaking of careers, she is really, and I'm serious right now, she is on her way for two careers. She's either going to be a lawyer or a criminal when she grows up. <laughs> These are two. But some of you are like, that's not funny, right? Brett, don't say that about your child. You don't know my child, okay? You don't know my child. Some of you are like, yeah, I got three of them, right? We're working on them. They share the same parole officer. It's fine. Um, no. Addison is one of those that when she thinks it, she does it, right? When she thinks it, she does it. She had just learned how to not pee herself, okay? I don't know what age that was for you, but for her it was when she was three, okay? She comes down first thing in the morning, this Saturday morning. Ashley and I are in bed. She comes down, fully clothed from here, but naked, here now. <laughs> Ashley looks over at me. She's like, you're taking this one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. <coughs> I go upstairs with the child. Right? When I get in there, here's what we find. Okay. Here's her bed. Seven steps. There's the toilet. In the middle of those seven steps, here's what I find. Pajama pants. Underwear. Soaked in urine. Yeah. What she had decided to do that morning was to wake up, really need to go pee, make it three steps, <laughs> drop trowel right there, and continue <laughs> her business. And no one asked, and she wasn't like, oh no, she was like, yeah, yeah, right? Because that's just what she did. Now part of me, as the, Ashley's the good parent, okay? Part of me was like, let's go mark some more territory. This is awesome, right? But I look at her, and I said, child, why did you do this? And this is what she said. She said, Daddy, I just thought I'd mix it up a little bit. <laughs> I just thought I'd mix it up a little bit. That's all, that's all the data she needed, right? That's all she needed from that. That's all I want to do. She, she is just a handful, but she's not the last one. We've got a four-year-old. Her name is Emerlyn. Right? Emerlyn. Right? We've got Emerlyn, Addison, Vivian. Emerlyn has got some tendencies that we don't know exactly where they're going to go. An explanation. I was in Colorado all last week. A week before that, I was in Oregon all week, speaking at some football things. Actually in Roseburg, Oregon. Right. Yeah. Now, we left that town about three days after uh, or before that shooting. Um, but uh, when I got home, I just had a day in between that two-week stretch, right? Um, and I see Vivian, she gives me a hug. I see Addison, she's like, hello. Right? <laughs> Eight-year-old. I saw a little Emerlyn, four years old, right? She looks at me from across, from across the living room, and she goes, ha! <laughs> Which is her way of saying, I love you, will, will you give me a hug? That's her way of saying that, right? I mean, that's, that's, just, that's just the way she is. And so what do you do with a four-year-old? Well, what, what you teach them. Right? They don't know anything. You teach them and you go to work, right? And what we hope that we're doing, and Ashley went to the parent-teacher conference last night, all three went to grade school, and uh, they were really short because, you know, we've been blessed with some, with some, with some good, good brains and some good heads with some good kids. And uh, what we hope that the teachers think of our girls is that they've gotten something good to work with. Ah, thank you. Thank you, people that have these individuals at home for teaching them manners and teaching them respect and teaching them the value of hard work and teaching them how to be friendly. Thank you for doing that. When a student walks in and a teacher can think that, they're like, yes, because the work just seems a little easier. Not that you're going to necessarily educate them any better, right? Not that they're going to learn more. It just feels a lot better, right? And so, we, number one, we take, you know, where a student comes from matters. It absolutely matters, okay? Here's the second thing we know. Back to our notes. Second thing. Second thing we know is that Great teachers work with whatever they receive. Great teachers work with whatever they receive. 
right? Whatever they receive, they work with. Right? So, great teachers. All right, 2011, I did a little, I did a little research, speaking of. Not quite MBA level, but, uh, you know, I didn't pass the test, so I just stopped with a bachelor's degree. Uh, so, in the, but, but I, wanted to, I wanted to do a poll to a bunch of students I know. A lot of students that I know are from the CTE, CTSO world, right? They connect with me from the programs that I, that I speak at. And I, and I asked a couple of questions oh, via Facebook, um, you know, via, via email, um, just in, in person, in audiences, and I asked a couple of questions, and one of them was about, tell me about your best teachers. Why are they so great? Okay. Why are they so great? Here's the list, okay? And you don't have to type this list in. In fact, before I forget, go ahead and type this in, please. This is the, you're going to need to get specific on this. Please type or write this down, all right? Tinyurl.com. Tinyurl.com. And Trey, if you want to, if you want to flip over to that slide and just go to the slide over here and get tinyurl.com forward slash reps quote cards, R H E T T S. And Trey's going to throw us a uh, PowerPoint that I've got. Reps quote cards. Ret and card both ends with an S. Trey's going to throw that URL up there. It's like four or five slides in. Trey, if you wouldn't mind, please. Look to your partner, see if they, see if they wrote or typed in the same thing as you do. Tinyurl.com. Right. Forward slash Rhett's quote cards. You now did a nice job. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he's getting there. Trey's, Trey's a PowerPoint professional. Leave him alone. He knows what he's doing. Just a little delayed. A little... Hey, stop right there. Uh huh. Yeah. See what I'm talking about? Mm hmm. Yep. Now, okay, keep going. That's, yep, that's, yep. Those are the children. Those are the offspring. Hello, babies. Yep, keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Stop! <laughs> Thank you, Trey. Let's give Trey a round of applause. All right. So if you this is this is what you should have written down. Okay. You go there. This list, as well as another list that we're not going to get to probably, is going to be on there. But here's here's what the students said. And this was about 400 students that I polled. Tell me about your best teachers and why. So anyone in the room that's working on teachers and working on, okay, we got a really good curriculum, it's awesome. We got really good, you know, school, that's awesome. Do we have an individual in front of those students that knows how to, right, get them engaged? How to take that curriculum and do something great with it. Okay. Organize. Students said, we love it when a teacher's organized. Passionate about their subject. Seeks professional development. Passionate about student success. Do you notice the word they use? Passionate. What does passionate mean? Passionate means that I can sit up here and talk about my girls, but if you don't see it in my face, if you don't hear it in my voice, if you don't see it in how I operate daily with my children, then it's, then it's not passion. Right? It's not passion. Holds high expectations for students. I like that one a lot. Challenges each and every mind. Avoids using negative weather. Invest in students beyond the classroom. Hello. CTSO. CTE. Right. <coughs> Invest in students beyond the classroom. So when you have an opportunity to look at what are we working on with teachers, okay? You can go to this and you can see that list and you can think about it. Read it before you go to bed tonight. Organize, passionate about subjects, seeks professional development, passionate about student success, holds high expectations for students, challenges each and every mind, avoids using negative weapons, invests in students beyond the classroom. Are these are these anything new and fancy? No. Do we get together at conferences like this to hear about new and fancy? Yes. Do we also get together at conferences like this to be reminded about what's most important? What's the seven irons? These are the seven irons, and not in, in from the students, right? These are the things that if you don't get this, I don't care how good the curriculum is. I don't care how fancy the school looks. I don't care how, you know, anything else. If the individual standing in front of them, right, is missing many of these things, then we got a problem. Then we're all just wasting our time, and we should just go do the, the, all the awesome, wonderful things that there are to do in Oklahoma. It's about 12, and they're great, right? And I've lived here my entire life, okay? And so what do you do with that list? Well, I want anyone in the room that's educating teachers and leading teachers to you can just, just do some cross-referencing and say, what are we doing with this in terms of how we're working on teachers? 
So there's a teacher from Oklahoma who is up, and I think one of the final five maybe, for CTE Teacher of the Year, okay? And uh, she asked me to uh, help coach her for her interview. And she teaches at a school just north of Oklahoma City here. And, you know, one thing that I do a lot of interview coaching as well, mainly in the Miss America uh, system. That's another story. We could <laughs> talk about it at tap work, but I'm not going. I've got, to, <laughs> I've got a date. Um, the one thing that we're coaching folks on interview is to talk about content, to make sure you got stories, right? you gotta, you got to get to that. This, she didn't need any help with content, right? You can't be a finalist for TC, CTE Teacher of the Year and not have just phenomenal content. And every time we get together, she, I mean, you know, the challenge is give less, right? Because she's got so much stuff to give. Why? Because great CTSO advisors and CTE teachers are, they've got stories every day and success stories and, you know, they're, and, and students that are just out changing the world, getting jobs, getting jobs before they graduate, getting jobs while they're in high school. Her interview was two days ago and that was, she was so excited that she got to share one of the stories of a student that already has a job, still in school, and was found out about that job because of her work in uh, BPA, right? That's the secret of career tech. That's where it's at right there, right? That's, that's the seven iron of it. That student had so many things die over the life of their career in that class, right? That everything that remained was just so amazing and important in their life, right? And my dad, when he was inducted in the, into the Ag Teacher Hall of Fame, you know, and I, and I look at that list, I'm like, yep, 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 absolutely, yeah. Because that's the thing. When you're putting a, hey, teacher, go advise a DECA chapter. Go advise a BPA chapter. Go advise an FDR chapter. When you're putting that in front of them, you're throwing them in the death stuff. You're like, here, you got a busy life. Well, by the way, here's 72 more things you need to do. Right? I mean, the most common answer of those students was organize. And that's an absolute necessity for any educator that is in the career tech system or even out of, but for sure in the career tech system, they have got to be that. Or it's just going to be a, you know, train wreck every day for everyone involved, right? And so those are about one word, and that word is engagement, okay? Engagement. If we're leading our teachers into understanding how to do something, it's how to engage people. I hope that when you're done here, yeah, there's a part, when we're done here in five minutes, I hope that there's a part that you're thinking, man, I'm glad that Rhett came, he was funny, but looks on everything. Right? I hope that you say, man, that, you know, there was a couple of really good thoughts that Rhett put in front of us. I hope you say that. But the most important thing that I hope you say is that, man, that was an engaging experience. An engaging experience. Because if it's an engaging experience, once we get you engaged, then we can do so many things with it. It's like if you know a really good presenter, a really good teacher, a really good pastor, they'll make you laugh. Why do they make you laugh? Because when you laugh, then you listen to them. Right? That's why we tell funny stories. Because it's engaging. When you're laughing, you're listening. My mentor, Bill Corden, taught me that. And how did I meet him? Through the, the fall organization, right? <laughs> and so my final thing for you is just to say that uh, well, we've got these first two, right? We've got these first two. Number one is, it matters where student comes from. Number two, great teachers work with what they receive. Number three is that the CTE system works, career tech education system works because the process works. The process that's in place works. That's why CTE works. CTE works because the process works. You've got classroom instruction, you've got hands-on, beyond the classroom experiences, and then you've got this student organization that connects the two and provides competitions, provides awards, provides scholarships, provides all this stuff. You got all three of those, the three circles, classroom instruction, hands-on experiences, and then the leadership and, and, and awards and competitive instruction. That system works, okay? And number four, and my final thought for you, is that the quantity of the impact, the quantity of the impact, is directly influenced by the quality of the leadership. The quantity 
of the impact, how large the impact is, is directly influenced by the quality of the leadership. And what I mean by leadership in this context is ambassadorship. Because leadership is one of those words like, let's go buy groceries. Right? Let's go buy groceries. You go buy groceries. Trey, go, Trey wants to go to Walmart, buy groceries, $700. He wishes he would have been more specific. Right? Okay. Leadership is like one of those words. A lot like entrepreneurship. It means a million different things. In that store of entrepreneurship, there's 18,000 different aisles. you got to pick one. Right? What I mean by leadership here is ambassadorship. So that list that you're going to go find, you're going to see another list when you go to tinyurl.com forward slash red quote cards. The other list you're going to find is about what we should be doing as leaders in this system about how to help our teachers be ambassadors for the system. If we're not teaching them how to be ambassadors, how to wear the colors, how to get behind the ideas that were made by national, but we don't understand it on the local level, how to go out and, 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 and work for funds and work for sponsorships and work for administrative support and work to get become friends with the coaches because the coaches don't like us because our students are doing this all this after after class stuff, right? If we're not helping build their ambassadorship muscles, then we're missing so many of the, of the things that are important. So when I say number four, the quantity of the impact is directly influenced by the quality of the leadership, that's the word that I mean there is ambassadorship. <coughs> and my friends, a year ago I was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And it was the size of Wilson. And they took it out. And it was benign. And I'm healthier today than I've ever been in my adult life because I had a brain tumor. Still don't know how that works, but it does. And I'm able to be with you today, and I'm able to have the life that I have today because of those things that I said at the very first. Because of my faith, and the miracles are a fact, not opinion. And because of my family, and because of the people in my life that I know through FFA, and FBLA, and FCCLA, and EPA, and DECA these student organizations that came to Ashley and I's rescue when we needed it most. And I, if I had time or if I was going to tap work, I would blow your mind with miracles that people have brought in our life that I hope is happening in some way in the Gleason family. And so, you never know how you're going to impact students' lives. I haven't been a member of FFA for over 20 years. But in 2014, my life was saved by a number of very key people, many of those folks that are in my network because of my work and my time in CTE. And so some of those people are in this room. And so thank you for that. And what I say to you is, this is what we're all about. And God allowed a tumor in my life to strengthen this message in thousands of people. And this is what this conference is about. Keep taking notes, keep looking for ways that you can serve the people that are in your life. Because mine may have been a brain tumor, but uh, there's challenges in our students' lives that are even greater than that. And we don't know that. That's why we give them our best. I hope that you had some fun tonight. Thank you for being in my beautiful state. <laughs> So uh, I hope it blesses your life, and after you read it, please give it to someone else. So uh, thank you for coming.